All right. I think we can see most of the people. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Will Swift, and I'm the moderator for the uh, uh, Scaling the Castle Walls, uh, Dealing with Gatekeepers panel. And uh, we uh, I just want to say briefly that I got interested because in my books on presidential uh, books, I got good to, to very good uh, cooperation from gatekeepers. But when I tried to do a biography of Joan Baez after interviewing 37 people, the manager blocked me. So I'm interested to hear the stories of our panelists. And today we have uh, Cotty Martin uh, is on the upper right, and she's had a lot of experience with uh, writing her biography of Angela Merkel and uh, uh, also working on the First Ladies, among other books. Uh, Susan Morrison, who's done a, a book on Hillary Clinton and is working on a biography of Lauren Michaels now, Saturday Night Live. And Carl Rollison, who's done 14 biographies, including uh, some people like Susan Sontag, Norman Mailer, and Martha Gellhorn, who were living and he had to, he had to come to terms with. So um, the we, we define, and I would just want to say a personal word to thank Kai Bird, who worked with me on developing this panel uh, and helping me to get the correct people to be on. So just we, just, we define a gatekeeper as a, a manager, relative, or colleague, or other who's in charge of asset, access to the subject of the biography, their archives, and people who are close to the subject or who have valuable information. So that's what we're going to focus on. So let's dive right in. And my first question to get you really in the middle of it is, what was the biggest obstacle you faced or you or your colleagues faced in dealing with a gatekeeper? And what were the strategies that were successful or less successful in handling that obstacle? So let's start, start with Kati and go from there. Thank you so much, Will. Well, I had uh, the ultimate gatekeeper, the chancellor of Germany, who was completely uninterested in having this or any other book that delved beyond her surface role as chancellor. She had built a well, I'll call it a Berlin Wall around herself to, to keep the likes of me out. And so my challenge was to write a book that captured the human story of Angela Merkel, this astonishing rise um, of, a, of a triple outsider, a, uh, a scientist from the East and a woman in an all male political culture. So how did she, how did she gain and keep power for 16 unprecedented years? And I, the, my approach to that was to penetrate her circle. And her circle uh, consisted really of only three people because she's not a trusting soul. Um, and uh, through the old fashioned way, patient um, trips uh, to, to, the, uh, to the chancellery over five years, I befriended them. And uh, although, although she never sat down for a full interview. She, she hasn't done that with any, not even with her authorized biographer. Um, she allowed me, because I gained the trust of her inner circle, she allowed me to observe her at work, which in some ways was more useful than her own version of herself. I, you, you mentioned that I'd written about uh, presidential marriages. I, 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 unlike with Merkel, with the presidential marriages, I interviewed all the surviving first couples and they were the least useful uh, interviewees in terms of, uh, of, of of getting at the truth. We never turn down those interviews, but nor do they ever really reveal things that they don't want us to know. Okay, great. And Susan? Hello, thanks, Will. Well, I can answer this both from my career as a magazine editor, editing a lot of okay. profiles, and also in connection with my Lord Michaels book. Um, I mean, generally, what always amazes me is how many publicists and handlers seem to think that if they say no to you, you're just going to go away. You know, <laughs> they don't often understand that we live in the United States and that you can just write the, the story anyway. So one of the things that I'm always counseling writers to do, and, and I mean, I didn't have to pull this card very often in my book, but it's just to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm writing this anyway, I'm writing about X. And 
a particular strategy that that works and has worked with a couple of reluctant people in my book is you say, all right, well, if Mr. X doesn't want to talk to me, you know, this person and that person, the other person have told me a lot of stories involving him. And I certainly want to give you the opportunity to confirm or deny or, you know, I want to get everything right. Um, So perhaps I can circle back later and we can go over what is in my book or my manuscript about you know, Mr. X, so that you have the opportunity to, you know, to get it right. And I think sometimes with the younger publicists, you know, they're, they're really kind of like, you know, what you're going to write it anyway, you know, they kind of can't believe that you would dare to do, you know, what we call a write around in the magazine business. But I think since most of these people, they wake up in the morning and basically their aim for the day is not to get screamed at by their client for some reason. Uh, They, you know, when you say that that you want to you don't want to print anything wrong about their client and you're going to give them the opportunity at some point to go over the facts they'll usually you know come around and think about that so sometimes it's more like a delay thing you don't get them at the beginning but you'll get them at the end okay and carl well i was interested in uh, listening to kadi because uh, she mentioned the center circle of three people well with susan sontag just about anyone, anyone felt they were close to Susan Sontag who knew her at all. So they all thought of themselves as gatekeepers. Uh, there was an armada, an army, an avalanche of gatekeepers, uh, all of whom thought that in some sense they were protecting their friend Susan Sontag. So the question for me was not, how do I get one person, uh, one gatekeeper to speak? Uh, and fortunately, I had uh, my wife as a co-author, who was also an attorney, uh, in case we ran into legal issues and legal problems. But the really the 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 point for me with any of the biographies I've done of living figures is, what story do I think I can tell? Uh, what kind of story am I going to tell? So again, I'll narrow it down to Sontag and uh, mention the title of the book. Susan Sontag, The Making of an Icon. Was there a story there that my wife and I could tell about Susan Sontag, regardless of whether her publisher, Roger Strauss, who was a meanie uh, and who didn't believe in unauthorized biographies, uh, or other friends uh, or attorneys like Martin Garbus, who who called up and tried to intimidate our agent? Um, Was there a story to tell? Years before we began the Sontag biography, there was just a little item in Publishers Weekly, which said that Fair Strauss, Sontag's publisher, had given a a significant number of files to the New York Public Library. And I sort of filed that away and I thought, that could be the bedrock of our book because Fair Strauss was her one and only publisher. And uh, they, in some ways, created the icon. If we could get access to that sort of bedrock of material, uh, of course we wanted to interview as many people as we could, but we, if the story was there in its outlines uh, and we got a grasp of those outlines, we could begin to interview people and tell them things that we knew from the Ferris Strauss files that they didn't know. Uh, and so the first thing I did was contact the New York Public Library. The collection was uncatalogued, but uh, thank God uh, they let us in before it was cataloged, before it was put into categories. And we got to look at everything. Well, there was the arsenal. Uh, it's not that and we can talk about this later in, in the panel, but it's not that we didn't run into trouble. We certainly did. Uh, but we always had that archive. We always had that bedrock to rely on. Uh, and so what I would say to you, whoever you're writing about is really think hard about, don't think of just about, well, can I have access to this person or that archive or this thing or that thing? What is it you want to do in your biography? Once you got that figured out, then those other obstacles may remain obstacles. In some cases, you can go around them, uh, or in some, some cases, you may have to give up on this person or that person, but you've got your story. 
Okay. Well, can I just jump in here? Sure. Because I, I, I didn't want to give the impression um, that the three people who are uh, uh, Angela Merkel's closest aides were, were uh, the bedrock of my narrative, not at all. Um, in some ways, I, I find the gatekeepers to be the least interesting part of, uh, of the biography, because we do, we, you know, we're seasoned uh, uh, reporters and biographers, we know how to maneuver around them. But I, I find the most interesting uh, part of any biography are the, is, is the youth and the formation and, you know, how did this person become this person? How did, how did, uh, in my case, uh, uh, Angela, a child of uh, a product of the police state, the Stasi state of East Germany. How did how did she learn to maneuver um, around around the Stasi? And and you know why why did she jump from being a physicist, which is what she was trained to be, um, into politics? And so to get to that um, uh, uh, stream of the, of the biography, which is to me so interesting. And, and because I, I had a similar childhood, uh, I was raised in Soviet occupied Hungary. So I knew, um, what it was like to live in a police state. And I knew that that had a huge role in who she became and, and why she subsequently learned to camouflage uh, her her thoughts and and actions, e even when she was the most powerful woman in in the world. Um, how did how she never revealed herself because she learned early on that to call attention to yourself and to reveal your uh, your your inner um, uh, uh, thinking was was very dangerous in a police state where every third person was informing on you. So I in in some ways, by the time she got to the chancellery, um, she was uh, she was Angela Merkel. And she but it turned out that that growing up in a in a in the Stasi state was extraordinarily useful in mastering not only German politics, but then once uh, once she became the, the, uh, for a while, she was the, the speaker of the West because Obama handed off that role uh, mm. to her because Obama couldn't tolerate Putin. And, mm. uh, and so she became during, during um, the, 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 the Putin's first aggression in, in Ukraine in 2014, she was the one who was negotiating with Putin, which she did very successfully right. because he too was a, a product of the same uh, the, the same totalitarian model. So she, she knew exactly his capacity for cruelty and, and deception, but it all started in her childhood. Okay. And I have a question for you all. Did any of you encounter, have any of you or your colleagues encountered threats from gatekeepers? And if so, what were the threats and how did you work around? <laughs> I, uh, I, <laughs> I encountered threats of, of uh, from from others who were who were trying to get inside the palace walls and and were resentful of of uh, of my stealth approach and and who uh, mostly mostly um, people inside the Berlin bubble journalists who who'd been frustrated for sixteen years. Of, of not getting close. Um, and and uh, so threat, not, not physical threats, but just a lot of undermining and, and sniping. And uh, who, who do you think you are coming here from New York um, and, and hanging out in the, in the chancellery when, when we've been trying to get to her all these years and, and she's, she's stayed mum. So a lot of hostility, I would say more than threats. Okay, Carl or Susan? I well, mean... I live under threat all the time. <laughs> uh, Martin Garbus, I mentioned him once before, called up my agent and said, oh, there might be issues of libel here. Third parties might be libel and so on. Uh, could I take a look at the book? This is Martin Garbus, you know, the great First Amendment attorney. Uh, but when you're Susan Sontag's friend, you can do all sorts of things. Uh, there was that. Uh, there was Andrew Wiley who said, who are these people? Uh, after we'd written a letter to him, of course, he didn't know who we are because we weren't part of Sontag's inner circle. So that wasn't too surprising. Uh, with the Gellhorn uh, biography, she, she wrote a, um, uh, a threatening letter. Uh, both the uh, Sontag and the Gellhorn biographies were vetted by attorneys. 
both publishers, and we can get to this issue later, you have to be, I think, very careful about who your publisher is, what your publisher knows, and your publisher's own history of dealing with such things. In both the Gellhorn case, well, the Gellhorn case is interesting because it was the book was originally under contract with Doubleday and Gellhorn was successful in frightening them. They never rejected the book. They just sat on it for a long time until they finally violated the contract, which had a clause in it that said, after a certain time, you have to say yes or no, are you gonna publish this book or not? And they never did, they just dithered. So then it went to St. Martin's Press and they had an attorney uh, vet the book and they simply wrote a very terse letter uh, to uh, Gellhorn's attorney saying there's nothing actionable in this book, which is exactly the same thing that W.W. W. Norton did when Sontag had a, uh, a Manhattan white shoe law firm uh, write and threaten the publisher. So I think it, it's ex extremely important, I think, that you and your, your publisher are in, on the same wave, wavelength, so to speak. That's so great. interesting that you would say uh, that about Roger Strauss, because uh, Roger published my book, uh, The Polk Conspiracy, Murder and Cover-Up in the Case of CBS Correspondent George Polk. Yeah. And there I did have actual violent threats and a criminal libel suit from the Greek right wing. And Roger was totally behind me. Mm. And uh, I was served a, you know, a pilot, a, a subpoena uh, well, well, high, yeah. uh, to well, appear in court. And Roger hired the best attorney. And so in that case, where it was me against the Greek right wing, in the case of George Polk, uh, so it's interesting that, that uh, yeah, Roger well, changed his tune when his friend was Oh, absolutely. Well, that's just, this happens all the time in literary life. It depends on who you're friends with. In both cases, he was protecting you. his author. Right? And yes. And in, in Roger right. Strauss's case, he had a Norton editor, Starling Lawrence, who was under contract uh, with a novel. And he canceled Starling Lawrence's novel when Starling Lawrence wouldn't cancel our book. Uh, this all got into the New Yorker and the story in which... Uh, Strauss is quoted as, as calling up Starling Lawrence and referring to our book, he said, kill the fucker. Hmm. Yeah, Susan makes a good point that, that in both your instance and, and mine, it was about- Protecting his author, which is his job, you know. Yeah. Um, I'd like to follow up with another question, start with Susan. Um, how do you work the trade-off between getting access and having independence as you write these books? Yes, well, I think that you know, my book isn't isn't an authorized book. Um, I mean, these labels are also fu fuzzy. You know, there isn't they're not well defined. But my book isn't authorized, and yet I have had just enormous cooperation and dozens of hours of interviews with my subject. And the thing is, I think that I. I sold my book uh, to Random House and I said, I, I have not secured uh, access, but I, I believe I will. And if I don't, I'm sure I'd be able to write a good book anyway, because I'm, I move in this, these circles. I know these people, I'll, I'll be able to do a good book. So that then when I went um, and, and, and approached Lauren Michaels, who, who knew me a little bit from way back when, uh, I, I, I said, I'm going to write this book. I have a contract to write this book. I don't need anything from you. Of course, it would be better and richer and probably, you know, in every way, if you'd like to be involved in it. And I, you know, I think at first he was a little startled, but, but I think he recognized, well, first of all, he, you know, respected and liked me enough that I think he thought that it would probably be, you know, a, a, a worthwhile book. And he, he was smart enough, as I think a lot of subjects are, to recognize that it's better to have a, a, an independent scholarly book written about you than something that's going to appear to people as a vanity project, you know, to sort of anoint someone to write your life, to invite somebody in to your, you know, go through your files. And because then you look a little bit like an egomaniac, like I've hired this person to write my hagiography. And so you know, and I, so I feel I have complete independence, you know, I mean, there's nobody will ever look at anything that I've done uh, except for my editor until it's out. But I, I think that for the subject, the intelligent subject anyway, that's a better way for them to go do because it gives them plausible deniability. You know, if he and everybody connected to it ends up hating the book, well, you know, it's not as if they, they, uh, you know, had any, any, part in 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 
signing it up or creating it. So it's, I, I, I would never make any kind of a deal with anybody that I was writing about. I mean, the only, the closest, you know, occasionally uh, in very sensitive things, people want to go off the record. You agree that you'll go back and go over the material with them later, but that's the extent of it. I mean, I, I, you hear about people writing books and, and agreeing to let the person or anyone else look at it first. I mean, to me, that's just, right. I can't imagine it. And, and one thing I want to say, uh, if anyone who is in the audience has questions, there's a chat thing where you can put them forward because we'll have 15 minutes at the end uh, to deal with questions from the audience. Carl, did you have any other comment on the access independence? Uh, uh, well, I've always been uh, independent. Uh, <laughs> I've never done what I would call an authorized biography. Curious thing is I've done several books, a uh, biography of Dean Andrews, a biography of Walter Brennan, a biography of Rebecca West, where I had excellent cooperation from the family uh, and friends. No one uh, ever uh, wanted any sort of quid pro quo or asked to see things. In some cases, there was such a level of trust that I did show uh, parts of my book to people who I had interviewed uh, to see if there were uh, errors uh, and they corrected some things in the book, uh, but there was nothing written down that they had any kind of approval or that my access was predicated on, um, on my doing this, that, or the other thing. Um, I know that a lot of biographers work with uh, release forms and permissions and so on. I've never done that. I guess I'm high risk in that sense. I take those risks uh, because I've sized up these people. And of course I could be mistaken. I've been very fortunate in that in all those cases, and in the right. case of Walter Brennan's family, they never, they never even ever raised the issue of wanting to read the book or anything like that. Um, so it, you know, I, I think our experiences are so individual depending on the subjects. And, and those who, who befriend or are subjects' families that, that can make you know, all the difference in the world. I think, um, Will, if I may, I think that, that the most important thing we have, each of us, um, uh, going for us, uh, more, more than access, more than, than accommodating uh, subjects, is, um, is, that, is that we are people with established reputations. And therefore, you know, if Merkel... Um, would have uh, would would have had doubts about um, my my honesty or my straight shooting ways. Uh, I'm quite sure that she wouldn't have tolerated all my trips to the chancellery. Um, and so it is that that we uh, not to beat our drum, but you know we are we are people who who have um, who have a, a, a record. And, and that is uh, the strongest, uh, that's the greatest asset that we have, even when we're dealing with a, with a, a character who is as elusive as, as the Chancellor of Germany, who had no paper trail, because again, going back to her, her paranoia about privacy, she is the most private public person in the world. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I was able to, to um, uh, piece together who she really is because people reveal themselves ultimately, not only uh, in, in the spoken word or the written word, but I think um, most particularly in, by their actions. So by their actions, um, they, they tell us who they are. And if you, if you observe them, and if you uh, have an eye for detail, which all of us uh, presumably do, or we wouldn't be in this racket, um, you know, you see, you you see with with Merkel, I I could see her eyes roll when when Putin was mansplaining to her. She didn't have to, or or Trump for that matter. Um, you know, she didn't have to say uh, this guy's a jerk. Um, she just, right. you know, had to. <laughs> And 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 plus plus you know those those three people who who became my my sources insider circle would would come out of those meetings and and you know not not betray any trust but they would say well Putin arrived late again uh, that's his way of asserting 
um, his power. And, and the chancellor said to him, oh, Vladimir, have you been praying again? Um, which, because he had famously built a chapel for himself in the Kremlin. And I mean, who else uh, has, has the nerve to tease uh, Vladimir Putin, other than the German chancellor, and okay. and get away with it. So it, you know, it's little, it's little mm-hmm. shards like that That's that right. that that build the the mosaic. Okay. You just have to pay attention. Right. I have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience while we've been talking, and I'll I'll put two of them out for you all to address. One question was, what stage of of your work? Should, at what stage of your work should you contact the gatekeeper? And the other question was, is it necessary to keep the gatekeeper informed as you go along? What are your thoughts on that? Um, I'll I'll let the others speak first. (laughs) I I, uh, I don't I I, feel, I don't really have a gatekeeper with my book, but I uh, in ma- in magazine profiles, you know, very often there is some super publicist who's kind of trying to, uh, you know, thinks that they are in control of the thing. And in in a situation like that, I mean, I think you probably just kind of humor the person, you know, just sort of make them think that they're still important, just because you know, they, they, they need to hear that, but, but I never, you you never really, you know, you, there are, I don't know if any of you do magazine journalism, but, you know, increasingly uh, it'll happen where you'll set something up for a writer through a publicist or a writer will set it up through a publicist. And then the publicist actually thinks that they're going to be sitting there in the interview or on the phone line while the interview is being conducted. And, you know, I always say like, absolutely not to that, but it's it's fine if you need to kind of humor the person as you go along. Um, I, I, some, I mean, another thing is, again, I don't have like a particular gatekeeper, but what I've also in my book been lucky to not have to really deal with any publicists. And, you know, it, in my case, when people hear that Lauren, has, Lauren Michaels has been talking to me a lot, then and he basically doesn't talk to anybody and never has in his career, then they say, okay, well, gee, I guess I should talk to her, you know, and so, and then there are some tricky people who never talk to reporters who you have to get some of your other sources to grease the way for you, you know, and then, and, and I find that those people like, like you to go back to them and and thank them and say, thank you so much for getting this person for me, you know, and because it, when people do, people like to do favors for you because they like to feel important and, um, you know, yeah, keeping the wheels greased that way, I think is helpful. Okay. I, I think that our, our subjects um, don't help their case by uh, by um, sticking overzealous uh, gatekeepers on us. That that just um, brings out the. <laughs> the, the the most aggressive uh, part of us. I mean, to get an interview with Nancy Reagan, I had to go through a former director of central intelligence, quite quite literally, uh, Richard Helms. She before she would uh, before Nancy would talk to me, uh, I had to go through a grilling with 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 Helms. And then when I finally did get the interview, this was for my book Hidden Power about presidential marriages. She wouldn't let me take notes, which is which is really crazy because what I did then after spending a couple of hours with Nancy, I just ran like a bat out of hell to the nearest phone booth. There were still phone booths and 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 tried to reconstruct as best I could uh, everything she said and how much better for her uh, if if I had been able to record that. But she was such a control freak that, um, you know, she did herself no no service. Uh, by by uh, by this kind of an aggressive uh, right. by setting up by setting me up as a hostile uh, witness rather than befriending me. The one thing I, I would just like to add quickly is, and, and you probably as the writer wouldn't want to be the one to say this directly to the gatekeeper, but intelligent gatekeepers know that if they close, you know, all the friends close rank, all the people who like the subject don't talk to you. The people who are going to talk to you are the people who hate your subject. You know, exactly. they're yeah. always more than happy yes. to talk. And so if, if there's a way that could somehow be, you know, yeah. say, well, I did talk to so-and-so, um, you know, 
it, it because you, as, as Kadi was saying, you're doing your person a disservice if you keep all of their friends away and only, only let the journalists talk to the people who, you know, who hate their guts. It's crazy. <laughs> That's it's, a good point. It's counter counterintuitive, really. But it's 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 the controlling thing. I mean, but, these are controlling people. They can't they can't help themselves in a way. One one other way to think about this is that anyone you interview is a gatekeeper, uh, hmm. and then you think, oh my god, I got all these <laughs> gatekeepers to deal with. So what do you do about that? Why don't you think of yourself as a gatekeeper? After all, you're gathering all sorts of information that any particular person you're interviewing doesn't know or, or may not know. And so when I go into interviews, I go in, in a sense, also as a gatekeeper, mm -hmm. which means I'm prepared to say certain things that I know that I think that person that I'm interviewing doesn't know. And what that does, it, with it, it breaks down the whole notion of gatekeeping, that is, they're on that side and I'm on this side. Well, not really. Actually, we're all in this together. And that's what you have to convince them of, you know, that you've talked to this person, that person and so on. It's really become a kind of collective enterprise, you know. And so are you going to be part of this or not? I never say that directly to anybody. Right. But uh, it, as far as keeping in touch with the gatekeepers, I, I was just thinking of one example. This is actually a biography of Rebecca West. And I was writing about that after she had died. And the wife of, uh, the first wife of her son, Anthony West's wife, Kitty West, didn't like Rebecca very much, but she had some, you know, very valuable information and things uh, Rebecca West had given her and so on. And, and uh, Kitty knew I was dealing with the family um, and she, she didn't certainly know all the ins and outs. Uh, and I started to keep her informed just, uh, you know, I went to see her uh, at her cottage um, and we really hit it off. And then I started to write her letters just telling her, you know, you know who I talked to, you know, about this and that. Do you remember this one, Anthony, to that? So I, she wrote me, I would say, probably a dozen letters, at least fabulous letters mm -hmm. that I hadn't things that I hadn't thought to cover in the interviews just by keeping in touch with her. Uh, and she, I think she began, in fact, one of the things she said to me during the interview really hit home. She said, you know, Victoria Glendening did a biography of Rebecca West, and I thought we were friends. And after she published the biography, she never contacted me again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kitty was a tough old cookie, but boy, she was, she was wounded by that, that she, right. she, she just felt used. And so I had to convince her. And in fact, I'm still friends with the West fan, both sides of the family. When I say both sides, it, there was a problem with money. Anthony was the son, but he didn't get the money. The nephew got the money. Oh, so there was this division in the family. And I thought, when this book comes out, one side of the family, the other, they're just going to hate me. They're going to attack oh. me like, like, you know, like nothing. And just to make a long story short, you know what happened? It turns out that Rebecca had insulted everyone in her family. <laughs> so they, they all said, yeah, yeah, that's Rebecca. Yeah, I, I, can, I can relate to that. But Will, Will, if I could just jump in here, um, I, I think that um, that the, the, the three of us who are talking and 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 I include you as a, uh, also a, a distinguished biographer, I think that that um, we we have established reputations as being as treating our subjects as human beings, not as as, uh, you know, uh, targets for assassination. I don't hold to Janet Malcolm's um a, a line about how how uh, uh writers are all assassins I, I i don't operate that way i i have a great deal of compassion especially for people who are in the public eye wow. and who are trying to do good things and certainly uh, Merkel uh, fits that category. I, I treat my subjects as, as human beings, not as aha what can i find here that you know what trivial um, uh, detail of what embarrassing detail will I be able to uncover? Because frankly, um, I don't think we do our, our, our readers any service thereby, you know, that we have, we have uh, too many outlets for uh, uncovering um, embarrassing, um, embarrassing and, and stupid and inconsequential right. factoids. That's, I don't think that any of us is in that business. We're after interesting details that reveal something, 
um, important about our subject. Uh, and, and if we didn't have that going into the project, I don't think that uh, we would be we would be allowed inside the the palace gates or inside the chancellery. So I, I you know, if 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 I if I give any advice to to uh, future biographers, it's you know, be a human being first of all, yes. and treat your subjects with with uh, with humanity. I I was on the other side of this equation when George Packer um, was working on the biography of my husband Richard Holbrook, and I spent. Hunt, I would say, I mean, I wish I had a dollar for every hour I spent with George and gave him total access to all of Richard's uh, papers, diaries, scribbled notes, and didn't ask to read it, didn't ask to vet it. And I, but I trusted Packer as, as a, a, a decent human being and, and, uh, and a very fine writer. And not that he produced the book I would have produced. This is this isn't my Richard Holbrook, but it's his. But right. that, but you know, I, I think it's naive to for our subjects to assume that uh, that that we're going that we're writing to please them because if we are, then then we're in the wrong business. Well, it reminds me. One of the questions that came in was from someone who said that, "What advice do you all have?" for a no-name biographer, in other words, someone writing their first biography where they don't have that resume that will uh, impress the gatekeeper or the subject. Any advice uh, for, for that situation? Susan? Well, the first thing that I would say is, is just to start. I mean, <laughs> don't wait for a green light. Make it clear that you're gonna write this book or piece or whatever it is anyway, and just keep showing up. You know, you, you sh demonstrate your doggedness. Um, uh, you know, go to, if there's a memorial service or something, if somebody, you know, the crowd of the, involving the person that you're trying to write about, go to it. I mean, just become a familiar site to the, the, the the people that you need to talk to so that they, they know that you're just, you're not giving up. Um, I, I think, you know, if you can maybe get a, a, a piece of journalism published about the area or the person that you want to write about, I mean, just little, little ways to sort of get in the public record that you know your way around this area or this person. But really, I, th I think the key with everything is just to not wait for permission. You know, with, with magazine profiles, I always, if, if, if the person doesn't agree, I say, well, just start writing it. And once you've got some mileage, you know, that person or the person's gatekeeper will think, well, gee, that looks like it's happening. Maybe it would be smarter for me to, to talk to the person and try to control the narrative a little bit. And right. it's amazing how often that is what happens. Okay. Uh, anything, Carl, on that? Or? Yeah, my my first biography was of Marilyn Monroe, and I knew nobody. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood. I didn't know anybody in New York where she studied at the Actors Studio. I didn't know anybody. And I suddenly remembered uh, that I went to a party in Cape May, New Jersey, where I was working for the summer. And I met Bruce Minix, who lived in Cape May, but worked in New York. And he had been a soap opera director. And he once mentioned quite casually that he had done some work with the, um, uh, the man who had uh, been her masseur, Ralph Roberts. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was contact Bruce, uh, who was friends of my in-laws too. And I said, remember you told me about Ralph Roberts. Could you, you know, give me his contact information? We're talking about the 1980s before the internet. And that started me. Ralph handed me on to uh, Steffi Sidney, who was the son of the gossip columnist, uh, Sidney Skolsky. Eventually, I got to Susan Strasberg and the uh, actor studio people. You know, it, it builds and builds and builds. Right. Uh, you got to find somebody with a name or with a contact. And it begins very modestly. It's like Robert Carroll talking about Lyndon Johnson. He, he didn't start by writing to the people closest to Lyndon Johnson. You know, he, he went on the far edges of the circle and worked his way right. in. And right, that's, and, and that's and, part of what 
what you have to do. And in Robert, uh, his work with Robert Moses, Robert M Moses absolutely refused to have any contact with him. But after two years of hearing about all the interviews with <laughs> all the people that he knew, Moses finally called Bob Carroll up and said, why don't you come and talk to me? So persistence <laughs> is one of our, our key assets. Now, there's yes, a couple but but yes, but 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 one other thing for which there's no substitute. Uh, I agree with uh, that. You have to be dogged. You have to uh, be persistent. But you also, it really helps if you are um, in, in, in embarked on a biography with, um, to have lived a life. Right. I don't think that that uh, I would be able to capture a full human story if I wouldn't have some notion of what a lived life is about and the, and the failures and the successes and the disappointments and, and you know, the inevitable compromises that we all make in, in life. So I, I would not um, uh, suggest that, that someone, you know, right off the bat, right out of uh, college, um, uh, earn their chops by writing a biography. I think that would be a rather uh, a rather shallow product because how can you fully, I mean, I suppose there are some rare souls, but, uh, but, but, you know, uh, get your, um, get your grounding uh, on other forms of writing and journalism and, and, and observe, uh, observe hum, hum, your fellow humans and how they live and, and who are the ones who, who, uh, who are able to build successful lives and, and do good things for their fellow man. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's, more than, it's more than verbal facility. I think you right. need human skills. Can I just, can I just add, I mean, yeah. I, I, I mostly agree with what Kati said, but it, of course, made me think of the marvelous biography of Delmore Schwartz that Jim Atlas wrote when he was in his 20s. It was his first book, a fantastic book, that won the National Book Award. And, you know, it was terrific luck. He got a lot of amazing material. But another thing I just, I suppose it has probably been mentioned in these panels today, Jim's book called The Shadow in the Garden, ah. it's just all about his life as a biographer uh, it pretty much answers every question that we've talked about here today yes. about access yes, to people not wanting to talk to him. And it's the most beautiful book and funny, just, you know, I describes agree. him stumbling I, through yes. it in his twenties and then stumbling through it in his sixties with Saul Bellow and every one of you should read it. It's a great one, book. One of, yeah. One of the things about Jim's, Jim's book that we really have to say for someone who is in their twenties and for some reason really does want to write a biography is you usually get to it in your thirties and forties, but one of the things that Jim did, and I don't think he did it to set out deliberately to do this, but he had a mentor, Dwight McDonald, kept pressing him, kept saying, you know, this, that, and the other, why didn't you do this? Or, oh, you shouldn't have done that. I mean, yeah. he, he had someone, you know, on his side, he had someone right, right, rooting right. for him. It's yeah. a fabulous story about, it about is. having it is. someone like that on your side. Yeah, of yeah. That, but Jim, that yeah. Jim, who, who was a, a beloved friend uh, of mine and probably of everybody here, um, was, a, was a rare soul. Um, I, you know, I miss him. And, and he, he really, he, he, he was a mensch from the get-go. He, right. he, he had a big heart right. in addition to, uh, you know, he was a great stylist as well. But that, but I, so I would add a heart to um <laughs> to right. the talent um as a, as a requirement for for doing right. a biography that uh that will survive the the test of time right i, I also reminded of i think deirdre bear one was the pulitzer runner-up for her her book about writing biographies of simone de beauvoir and uh who was the other fellow that uh, uh jean paul sartre? 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 uh no the samuel Pope. beckett samuel beckett Samuel Beckett, thank yeah. you. Um, I'm getting a bunch of questions, so I'm gonna read. Um, if a key relative refuses to meet with you and vaguely threatens to sue you if you write the book, should you persist in trying to get an interview or deal with him at the publication stage? <laughs> well, that's where I would say, okay, you don't have to sit, sit down with me, but I would appreciate it if you would be willing to let me you know, fact check with you later because you, will be in the book, whether I meet with you or not. Okay. That's what I would do. Yeah, that's, that's good advice. And the other thing I did was marry a lawyer. 
<laughs> okay. Well, you, too you'll, late. You'll have some suggestions for lawyers to marry. Uh, how do you deal with a piece of information which two separate family members of my subject told me? One said it was off the record while the other didn't mention anything. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you've got it separately from the off the record. I second that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what, what advice do you have handling a situation where your subject reveals interesting and intriguing details about a relationship with someone in their lives that is key to the plot, then says, oh, but please don't put that in the book. I don't want to hurt, hurt the feelings of this other family. I have no patience with with that. You know, those uh, rules uh, about um, I, yeah. off the record are established uh, up front, not post fact. I um, have just, and yeah. and there's no there's no possibility of writing a a book worth its weight, a biography, particularly if if feelings aren't hurt. I mean, you just have to you, you that comes with the territory. You're, right. uh, yeah. you, you know, if you don't think my feelings were hurt by George Packer's account of Richard Holbrook, then <laughs> think again. And yeah. we're still friends. I mean, it's just, you know, we're grownups here. Um, when when I did a biography of Jill Craigie, uh, who was married to a famous British politician, Michael Foote, uh, the first thing I did, uh, he, she was dead when I started writing the biography, but Michael was very much alive. And I went to see him at his home in Hampstead. And before we talked about Jill at all, I had met Jill uh, because she was a friend of Rebecca West and so was Michael. So he was predisposed to, to think kindly of me, but, but I, I didn't let it rest at that. I said, Michael, we have to have a discussion about biography. And he had written a, a, a biography of Nye Bevan. Uh, so he knew what went into, and he was a journalist as well as a politician. But I said, you know, he said, I know what you're gonna say. He said, it's your book. Later, he changed his mind. Later, he said, oh, I don't like this, I don't like that. I said, remember what you said? It's your book. It is your book. Uh, you know, I, I think that has to be clear from the outset. Somebody can't okay. say suddenly, oh, you can't use it. And uh, yeah, this Nick, is one of those Nick, areas, I'll oh. just say, where email is quite awkward. I mean, I've had a couple of situations where I've had these very long, deep, wonderful interviews with somebody. And then like the next day, they'll send an email and say, you know, I feel really bad that I said, and you just, you can't, you know. It's, Sorry. It's tough. <laughs> Okay, mm. and uh, if Nick Boggs, are you, if you're still on, you put through a question, which I couldn't, I got overwhelmed with questions. Do you, are, if you could unmute yourself and ask your question, are you still here? Sure, I'm here. Hi, everybody. I, I was actually um, following up and reiterating a, a question that Celia Starr, I believe, had posted Go ahead. way earlier. Um, and I think she was asking, she was asking, you know, when, Maybe she wants to voice it, actually. I was just adding about um, quoting from, if you're going to quote from publicly available archives and you know that the gatekeepers don't want people to do that, they, it's unclear to me, you know, if you approach them, what do, you, do you hire a lawyer for the copyright stuff? You know, what, what, are, the, what are the guidelines here? But Celia had a, a, a related question that she might want to, if she's here, she might want to explain. Celia, yeah. are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just curious uh, if if your subject is not willing yet to grant permission to reproduce uh, their art, for example, or could be poems or literature, uh, but you really need to be able to reproduce. In my case, in my case, it's visuals. I do artists. So mm -hmm. if they're not willing to give you permission to reproduce the art and I'm not sure how I could write a book without having that. I'm, I'm not clear how to go about it. Like, I, I, I love everything that you're saying about keep, you know, being persistent. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if I, if I write the book and I still don't get permission to reproduce the art, I don't think my book is going to be really uh, effective. Well, well, that's a tough, that's a tough call. I've not dealt with, with that. Has it, do any of you have experience with that? Um, I did a short uh, biography really for young adults on Picasso and the, it, mm. it was a self-published book and the, and the Picasso estate simply wouldn't give permission to, mm. to uh, reprint things. Picasso was so well known though, mm. that in, you know, mm. I, gave, I provided links, you know, where, where the readers could easily access what I'm talking about. Um, the ideal thing would be with an ebook, you, you'd have hot links. As you'd be talking about Les Demoiselles uh, d'Avignon, and then you would click on the link, and there, there it would be. 
mm-hmm. uh, and you're not asking anybody's permission. It's it's there online. Right. Um, that's, that's, the, only that, thing that would be... the only thing I might say about that is if there would be, unless the, the person is already viewing you as an adversary, I, I don't know if that's the case, there might be a way to appeal to the artist's vanity. I mean, don't all artists want their work out there to be seen by, you know, it, in the same way that in the magazine world, very often, and this is preposterous, but it's true, you'll be trying to get somebody to be profiled and they really, they don't, they're, they're not interested. The gatekeeper's not interested. But then if you say, well, you know, Dick Avedon will take a picture. I mean, of course he's dead, but, you know, <laughs> back in the day or, Problem. you know, somebody, they'll say, oh, sure, because they're more interested in that part of it than, you know what I mean? I'm just wondering if there's a way to make it seem appeal to their spirit of self-promotion. Yes. Right. Always, always appeal to people's self-interest um, <laughs> in every in every situation. But, you know, can I just add just part of my problem? I just is want to say one thing. And Nigel Hamilton wrote in, use previously published copies of the art. Uh, <laughs> ah, smart. Yes, yes, of course. Seems uh, obvious. Here's another question. If you're told something off the record and the person who has told it to you dies, how do you deal with that if you abuse the material? In the end notes, do you say it came from an anonymous interview off the record? Do you identify the person? Oh, that's interesting. That's, that's a moral yeah. dilemma. I had I had anonymous sources with um, uh, Susan Sontag, my wife and I, and uh, we contacted a few people who were anonymous after she died and after University Press of Mississippi did a revised and updated edition of the Sontag biography, and they said, go ahead. Uh, they were still alive. There was one person who was Roger Strauss's right-hand man who, while he was alive, didn't want him him uh, I, himself identified. He didn't say, but after I die, you can do it. He didn't say one way or the other. So I decided to to Aaron Asher. I I, I named him. And and an, and another way around it is 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 to uh, uh, run with the substance of the quote without putting quotation marks around it. Um, after. You know, I, I've frequently done that when, um, I mean, there's a, there's a way to make sure that the information is conveyed um, if, it's, if it's relevant, if it's important, if, okay. if it moves the story forward. But if it's just trivial, then, then I would definitely not risk betrayal. And, so, and somebody wrote early on, so I wanna address their question. They said, how do you pry letters out of family members? <laughs> I got a good story. Uh, uh, she didn't want to be interviewed, Dashiell Hammond's daughter. I went to see her. We had coffee. The interview went over long. We had lunch. We were talking about things. She said she didn't want me to use a tape recorder. She didn't want me to do this. She didn't want to do that. And finally, at the end of lunch, she says, well, since I like you so much, she goes to her refrigerator and brings down this box of Dashiell Hammond and Lillian Hellman letters. And I said, you know what would be great? is if I turned on my tape recorder and you read those letters into the tape recorder and commented on them. She <laughs> said, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> well, that, that reminds me of, of uh, when Harry Truman uh, caught Bess uh, burning his letters to her. And, 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 and Harry said, Bess, think of history. And she said, <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, so you know, people have different perspectives uh, on. Uh, it, 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 it's important to to persuade the subject um, that this really is is ser- in the service of of history and setting the record straight. And you know, through quiet persuasion, one can usually bring bring people around. A great deal of time and a great deal of charm is necessary. Don't, don't expect, you know, an immediate uh, yes, but cultivation, cultivation. Jim Atlas, Jim Atlas had a very uh, good, um, he had a, he had a good tactic when he was working on the Bellow book. Bellow, all of Bellow's papers were at the University of Chicago. And even though they were pretty friendly at the outset, I, Bellow said, I don't want you in that. I don't want you in those papers. I don't want you using those papers. And so, but Jim eventually came up with a way, he said to him, all right, how about this? How about if I go through the papers, I take notes of the things that I would like to use and then 
before I publish the book, I'll sit with you and just tell you which items I would like to use and you can say yes or no. So that it it gives Bello this feeling of control. And you know, I don't I don't remember if he said no to some, but but he wasn't actually just giving away the store, you know, so it it would seem like a very intelligent way to deal with it. That's excellent. But so by then you need a relationship with the, you know, the before you have that conversation, you 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 need to have built up a, a relationship of trust and 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 good faith. You you can't start off by right. making making demands, but if and and that's why a biography takes time because you're dealing with human lives and and uh, building trust takes right. a lot of time. There's there's no shortcut to that, even even with all the technology that we have. There's no right. shortcut. Right. And Helen calls it said that she was a little unclear about one of your comments, Carl, about public. Publishers, she said, are there are certain publishers that would back out of publishing a book if there is a threat of litigation? Oh yeah, they get cold feet very easily. They're always looking for reasons to say no, to cancel a contract or whatever. Uh, it, it happens all the time. Uh, when we did the Sontag biography, my wife and I sat down with the publisher and had an extensive con uh, conversation about what is fair use and what, you know, what we're intending to do and so on. They were very clear on, on what we were going to do uh, because there's a lot of miscommunication. And publishers are surprisingly, which, what word should I use? Ignorant? Stupid? <laughs> uh, they don't, they don't, works. they really don't, they don't know the law. Uh, and if someone threatens them, that's enough for them to walk away. And that's why I say when I, when I, you know, it's be careful, what, you know, what publisher you pick. And some of them have policies. I understand now that W.W. Norton won't do a biography of a living figure. I don't know if that's true or not, or whether it's because they did our Sontag biography or what it is. Uh, but, but there are some, and Roger Strauss declared that too, no biographies of living figures ever. And I don't know if that still prevails or not, but it can. No, no. I've, I've never had a stupid publisher, but I, but I have had uh, conflict adverse publishers. And <laughs> and I, another think, quick question. I think that covers most of them. Somebody said, how do you deal with someone who you know will likely be an unreliable narrator who reaches out for, to you to be interviewed? Well, you use your discernment. <laughs> you don't, you're not obliged. You're not obliged to give them free reign. Um, you hear them out and you, you I, I find that I, I get something out of almost everybody I interview. And usually they, the, uh, I, I get three, three other names from that person. I, very few interviews get you nothing, but nor, nor are you obliged to, uh, uh, to, follow, to follow their uh, precepts. No, I agree. Oh. And, and something that's interesting about interviewing people who make errors, actually, it, 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 the, the, they're like little breadcrumbs. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. I'll be interviewing someone and then I'll realize that they, they had some kind of an unsavory relationship with, you know, mm -hmm. somebody mm -hmm. and and they'll get a bunch of things wrong that and I'm realize I, I know because I know everything now <laughs> that they're wrong. And it. <laughs> And it just, it does help you to be able to put all the other pieces together to know, you know, what the, the hot spots are. It's always useful, even, right. even if they're- hey, Just say that. yes. Yes, just say yes to yeah. the interview. And, and literally we have one minute left. Quick question. How do you deal with the issue of gatekeeping when you approach publishers for a contract? I think I've already answered that. Know your publisher. Know yeah. what your publisher's attitude toward these things is going to be. Okay. And, the other and if it's a if it's a if it's an interesting enough subject, a valuable enough subject, um, I think publishers are are persuadable. Um, and and again, it helps to have a track record. Um, right. And and therefore, biography shouldn't be. Um, I'm repeating myself. Biography shouldn't be the first thing you do right out of. Right out of uh, NYU. <laughs> exactly. Well, listen, we, we could probably go on for another hour. Mm -hmm. That's what I sense. 
if people have some questions that they, my email is drwswift at gmail.com. If anybody has a question they felt didn't get addressed, I'm happy to pass it on to the panel or one panelist so that you can get your money's worth, full, full money's worth today. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you to the panelists. And may we have another hour or two some other time. Thank, Thank you, Michael. Will. Great Thank job, you, Will. Will. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank okay. you, Carl and Susan. And Thank you, Thanks, Jenny. everybody, for tuning Thanks, in.